Welcome to Pizza Tower, a fast-paced, action-packed 2D platformer developed by Tour de Pizza. If you've been on the gaming side of the internet in the past 8 months, you've no doubt seen this game before. It's taken the internet by storm with its fast, fluid gameplay, charming visuals, and amazing soundtrack. And today, I intend on going through each of the levels in Pizza Tower and talking about their mechanics, gimmicks, and overall vibe with the purpose to see everything this game has to offer. Strap in everyone, we're about to go on quite the wild adventure. Without further ado, it's time to talk about the entirety of Pizza Tower. So, where to begin with this game? The opening cutscene gives us an idea of the plot. Pepino Spaghetti, owner of Pepino's Pizza, is one day confronted by Pizza Face, a floating pizza. Pizza Face threatens to destroy Pepino's restaurant with a giant laser from the top of his tower. Pepino decides the only thing he can do is destroy the pizza tower to save his restaurant. The plot is as simple as that, really. There are extra details behind the scenes, but really this is all you need for a game like this. Entering the tower itself, our first objective is to complete the tutorial to get a feel for how Pepino controls. Despite being a balding, middle-aged man, Pepino is quite fast and strong. Alongside the regular 2D platformer moves you'd expect, Pepino can body slam to destroy blocks and kill enemies, grab and hold enemies to throw them, and run fast enough to destroy metal blocks. Pepino can even run up walls and jump insanely high, so his mobility is second to none. The first floor of the tower, fittingly called the Tower Lobby, contains levels themed around castles and old things. We'll be exploring a hall of dead Pillar Johns, a heavily guarded castle, ancient ruins, and a creepy dungeon. Floor 1 also contains the tutorial, which teaches you all of the main controls and mechanics that you need to know to get through the tower, but we'll go over those while talking about the first level. So let's head over there and see what's going on in John Gutter. As the first level, John Gutter is very simple and is effectively the second half of the tutorial. It gives the player ample room to test their abilities and starts introducing a few of the dangerous enemies you'll encounter. Cheese slimes pose no threat, but fork knights will poke you with their giant fork and Swedish monkeys will slip you up with their banana peels. You know, to be honest, I don't have much to say about John Gutter. It's just a clean first stage that does a great job at introducing the many dangers you'll be facing in later stages, but it doesn't overwhelm you or throw absurdly difficult challenges at you. So instead of trying to find more to talk about with John Gutter, I'll talk about those main mechanics I glossed over in the tutorial. Pizza Tower has quite a few collectibles to pick up, but none are more important than these little guys, the toppings. Five appear in each stage, and they're all cute little living pizza toppings. You'll find mushroom, cheese, tomato, sausage, and pineapple in each stage, in that order. If you grab the sausage after cheese, you miss the tomato somewhere. You'll want to grab as many as possible, because they'll each give you 10 bucks after beating the stage, and that money is used to rent a boss gate from Mr. Stick. We'll get back to the bosses later. There are some extra things you can collect in each stage, of course. Regular toppings for one, small toppings give 10 points each, big toppings give 100. There are also variants that only appear during pizza time. Along with that, each stage has three secrets, usually hidden behind walls marked with eyes. These secrets test your abilities with that level's gimmicks, and are always filled with points to grab. Lastly, somewhere in each stage is Jerome, the tower's only janitor. Find him and lead him to the janitor's closet, and he'll unlock it for you, allowing you to grab the tower secret treasure. All of these increase your points, and are vital to getting the game's highest ranks. At the end of each level, you'll be given a rank based on how many points you got throughout the stage. The worst rank is D, and the best is S. There is a rank higher than S, but we'll get to it later. I don't want to explain too much all at once. At the end of the stage, you'll find Pillar John, the guy holding this entire level up. Destroy him, and pizza time starts. Now you've got a set amount of time to race back to the beginning of the level before it all crumbles with you inside. These are stressful segments, especially when the level throws you into Pillar John with no way to stop yourself. Running back through previous rooms can be difficult if you don't remember the layout very well, and that's not even mentioning that a room's layout can feel completely different if you're going through it backwards. You'll also often split off from the main path into a side path exclusive to pizza time, meaning you'll have brand new rooms to run through while under the stress of a timer. In a first playthrough, it's not uncommon to reach the door with only a few seconds left. I'll leave the explaining there for now, I'm not entirely done with all of the mechanics, but we'll get back to it later. For now, let's wrap it up here in John Gutter and move on. Entering the main part of Floor 1, we've got three other levels to tear through, and we're going to go in order of the symbols on the Pizza Granny sign up near the elevator. Up next is Pizzascape. Set in a medieval castle, Pizzascape is where the game starts showing its true colors, and I don't mean in terms of difficulty. 
This is the first level that shows how levels may have multiple ways of clearing one obstacle, and it starts showing that levels from here on out will have you do some light puzzle solving in order to move onwards. It also introduces the concept of each level having a few gimmicks, and usually a level specific transformation. The transformation used in Pizzascape is Night Pepino. Transformations will usually restrict some aspect of Pepino's movement while also giving him a new move or ability that must be used to clear obstacles. Knight Pepino trades out Pepino's mock run and grab for a heavy suit of armor, allowing Pepino to kill enemies on contact and slide down slopes. This is the first level that uses stupid rats, which can only be killed by transformations. Pizzascape is a great follow-up to John Gutter, as it gradually increases the difficulty while introducing new gimmicks and mechanics that are either exclusive to this level or will be seen a lot throughout the game. The transformations allow for a variety of new puzzles and challenges to overcome, but their main issue is that each transformation is only used in one level, and often for small periods of time. This works fine for transformations like the Knight, which don't have much potential, but future transformations can seem underutilized. Much like John Gutter, I've played Pizzascape so much that I don't have much to say on it. Really, it's just a solid second level that introduces some of the more complex aspects of Pizza Tower. Well, to make up for time, I'll tell you about the chef's tasks. Each level has three chef's tasks, which are just the game's achievements. Each chef's task usually requires you to complete a challenge related to a mechanic in the level. I like to imagine that each level has an easy task, a medium task, and a hard task, though the definition of difficulty here is a little blurry with some levels. Pizzascape's tasks will have you killing an enemy after being kicked by a pepperoni goblin, parrying ten fork knights, and avoiding slamming into walls as the knight. Chef's tasks aren't required to beat the game, but are required to get a 101% completion on a save file. There are also three extra achievements for beating the floor's boss without taking damage, getting an S rank on each level in the floor, and getting a P rank on each level in the floor. Anyway, that's basically everything I gotta say about Pizzascape. It's got a good theme going for it, the music is wonderful, especially Cold Spaghetti, and it's just a well-designed level. I suppose we should move on to the next level, which is quite the jump in difficulty for a majority of players. Ancient Cheese takes place in old ruins, with decorations heavily inspired by ancient Greek and Roman architecture. This level is the first major roadblock most players will have to get through, mostly thanks to this level's pizza time. This level doesn't introduce any new transformations, but it does introduce these bombs that you can grab like any regular enemy. You'll always throw them in an arc, and they can be used to destroy stupid rats. Ancient Cheese also features these cheese blocks that fade away a few seconds after you step on them, so you gotta be quick when crossing them. Thanks to the bombs, this level features far more puzzle solving than most levels in the game. As a result, it tends to feel slower than basically every other level. Overall, Ancient Cheese is an okay level that feels a little too difficult for the first floor. Changing the layout of a few rooms and removing some of the puzzle elements would most likely bring it on par with most of the levels in the game. Ancient Cheese isn't just a roadblock for new players, it can also be a roadblock for experienced players trying to get a P rank. Due to the surprisingly difficult layout of the rooms during pizza time, it's very common to fall down a pit or hit an enemy and lose your combo. Speaking of, I should probably introduce what a P rank is. P ranks are the hardest challenge the game has to offer. In order to get a P rank, not only do you have to get enough points for an S rank, find all three secrets, grab the treasure, and do the second lap, but you must also complete the stage without dropping your combo. You have to kill an enemy before leaving the first room to start the combo, and then you cannot lose the combo throughout the entire stage. Doing so loses the P rank. In quite a few levels, your S rank will change to a P rank the moment you enter the second lap portal, so your heart rate goes through the roof as you do your best to clear the second lap and escape before time runs out. It's a very difficult challenge, but when you exit the level with a P rank, you feel like you're on top of the world. The last level in Floor 1 is Blood Sauce Dungeon, probably the hardest level in this floor, but easily my favorite. Blood Sauce Dungeon is unique in that it's a very vertical level, nearly every room has you entering from the top and exiting from the bottom. There are also a lot of ramps connecting walls to the floor, so it's very useful to body slam or power bomb to maintain speed in rooms. This level's main gimmick is Blood Sauce, boiling pools of sauce that burn Pepino on contact and give him the fire butt transformation. Firebutt is one of the few transformations that doesn't help the player all that much. Pepino can move left and right, but is otherwise forced into the air and cannot do anything until he hits the ground. Blood Sauce Dungeon is commonly people's least favorite level in Floor 1, and I can totally understand why. The Blood Sauce can be very annoying if it sends you back to a higher platform, and the level's layout is very different from what every level in the game does, barring a few rooms and some random levels. 
However, that's actually part of why I like this level so much. The blood sauce is annoying, yes, but it can also be used to your advantage, like intentionally hitting the blood sauce in the first room to land on a higher platform during pizza time. And the unique layout is, well, unique. It's so different from most levels in the game that I'm drawn to it a lot more. So, we're done with all the levels in Floor 1, and now all we have left is the boss. Let's give some of our money to Mr. Stick and face whoever dares to block us from the next floor. The first boss in the game is Pepperman, a giant living pepper who makes art all day and is super egotistical. He's also, unfortunately, very strong, so despite him being the first boss, he'll give you a hard time if you're completely unprepared. The bosses in Pizza Tower all follow the same general structure. They'll throw out an attack, either completely randomly or based on how much health they have left, and once they're done, there will be a brief moment where they flash white and you can attack them. Dodge their attacks and whittle their health down to zero, and they'll jump into their second phase, where their attacks can be slightly stronger, they can be new environmental hazards, or some on-screen effect will try to mess you up. Unlike in levels, you're not invincible. You only have 6 HP, and if you lose it all, you're forced to start over. Your final rank is also based on how much damage you take during the fight. A P rank is done by taking no damage, an S rank is earned by taking 1 to 2, an A rank is 3 to 4, so on and so forth, until a D rank, where you must be hit 9 or more times. Pepperman's attacks are extremely simple, he'll try to ram into you or ground pound you. He always changes up his attacks after taking 2 damage. From his shoulder bash, he'll turn around when you dodge him. From the ground pound, he'll leap into the air and bounce off walls. Once he's down to 2 HP, he'll spawn blocks of marble that you must hit to carve a statue. Pepperman will constantly be shoulder bashing during this time, but will stop to admire a finished statue, giving you a perfect time to attack. In his second phase, Pepperman will speed up drastically, making his attacks harder to dodge. Throughout the fight, odd drawings of Pepperman and small statues will appear to try and hit you, though Pepperman can destroy the drawings. During Phase 2, a giant statue of Knight Pepperman will appear and move quickly across the arena, requiring you to dodge. Pepperman is definitely the easiest fight in the game, though some would argue a future boss is even easier. Either way, Pepperman will still give new players trouble, so here's a few tips to help you out. Don't try to mock run during these fights, it'll screw with your ability to dodge a lot. Parrying attacks is your best friend when it comes to avoiding damage, so remember to taunt right before being hit to parry. And lastly, Pepperman can be hard to hit while he's bouncing, so try to uppercut him by pressing up and grab. With Pepperman done, and every level in Floor 1 completed, we can move on to Floor 2, the Western District. Floor 2 is themed around the Wild West, and will have us traversing through an arid desert, a haunted graveyard, a peaceful farm, and an old saloon. Its levels are definitely a step up in difficulty from Floor 1, but we're still in the early game, so they're not absurdly hard. Let's begin with Floor 2's first level. Set in a vast, hot desert, Oregano Desert is one of the shortest levels in the game, assuming you avoid all of the pizza marts. Strewn throughout the level are five pizza marts, each containing one of the toppings. You need to complete the challenges inside to obtain all the toppings, but if you're in a rush, you can just run past them. This level's unique mechanics include chains of rock blocks that can be destroyed by attacking a destructible rock block. One of the new enemies, Tribal Cheeses, can dance around a totem pole to create thunderclouds that strike Pepino with lightning every few seconds. Oregano Desert also contains a new transformation, with Firemouth Pepino. When in Firemouth form, Pepino cannot mock run, grab, or crouch. Instead, he can kill enemies on contact and perform a mid-air dash by pressing grab. He can also, of course, kill stupid rats, but he can also explode TNT blocks that act very similarly to destructible rock blocks, but they can kill nearby enemies with their explosions. The Firemouth transformation is very fun to run around with, though, as with most transformations, I wish it was utilized a bit more. It does get used in some very creative ways in Oregano Desert, fortunately. One of the pizza marts requires you to avoid acquiring the transformation, and if you do get it, you'll have to clear it by touching a cow. The cows are a decently annoying part of the level, as they fling Pepino backwards when touched. Usually they'll fling Pepino into other cows or a destructible rock block. Near the end of the level, you enter a giant UFO. This portion contains a lot of cows that are difficult to dodge at high speed, and the UFO olive enemies appear for the first time, but aren't used again until floor 3. There's even a pizza mart in this UFO. 
at the bottom of the UFO is Pillar John, leading into the escape sequence. Pizza time in Oregano Desert is very interesting during a P-Rank run, as on your first lap you'll enter two pizza marts and grab the secret treasure, making you waste at least a minute and a half, but in the second lap you breeze through everything and get back to the door in 30 seconds. It's odd how short the escape sequences can be in some levels. Overall, Oregano Desert is a very good level with some fun gimmicks and mechanics along with two of the best songs in the soundtrack. Moving onwards, let's see what our next level holds. Taking place in an old graveyard, Waste Yard has one of my favorite level themes right off the bat. Unfortunately, it actually used to be one of my least favorite levels in the game for a while, and that's thanks to one of the level's main gimmicks. The most notable gimmick in Waste Yard is the ghost transformation, which turns Pepino into a spooky ghost, giving him free movement in the air. He can also eat ghost peppers to move faster, and at high speeds he can kill enemies and destroy special ghost blocks. Ghost Pepino can also pass through cheese graters that block access to certain routes or secrets. You'll also find heads sticking out of the ground throughout the level. If you touch them, you'll start riding the corpses like a surfboard. There's not a really particular use for these, most speedrunners just jump off of them immediately. The main gimmick that made me dislike the level initially is exclusive to Pizza Time. In certain rooms during Pizza Time, the ghost of Pillar John will appear and start chasing you down. If Ghost John touches Pepino, he'll be sent back to the beginning of the room. I hate being chased by things in games, so for a long time my anxiety was through the roof during Waste Yard's escape sequence. I'm all fine with it now, I've gotten good enough that Ghost John never catches me anymore. Waste Yard is a great level that features a fun transformation and an intense escape sequence. It's one that I often return to in Floor 2. The song used in the level, Tombstone Arizona, is also one of my favorites, and fits perfectly with the level's theme. Despite my initial thoughts on the level, the better I got at the game, the more I enjoyed playing Waste Yard. It also has quite the fun P-Rank. Following Waste Yard is Fun Farm, which is one of my least favorite levels in the game. It does nothing particularly wrong or bad, it's not difficult, the level is pretty well designed, it's just boring, honestly. The theme is okay, a farm fits for a game about living pizza, and some of the enemies are funny looking. The music is quite meh. The first song, Mort's Farm, feels very out of place in the rest of the soundtrack and is probably my least favorite song in the OSD. Though the second song, What's on the Kids Menu, is quite a banger, however. The level's gimmicks are also okay, nothing particularly stellar to me. The first gimmick introduced are flying ladders. They're like regular ladders, but they fly upwards before disappearing when you grab them. Very basic, but they're used pretty well on this stage. The second gimmick is the level's unique transformation, Mort the Chicken. Mort is the protagonist of a relatively unknown PS1 game, and yet he's made his way in here. Before he appeared in Pizza Tower, Mort was most well known as being the subject of a video by Nitro Rad, which was released five years ago. Mort sits on top of Pepino's head and drags him around. In this state, Pepino can't mock run, grab, or crouch like usual, but he gains a double jump and a unique attack that can kill certain enemies and swing on Mort hooks. This moveset is okay, I think. The Mort hooks are a unique mechanic that I like quite a bit, but to me a double jump is kind of pointless outside of jumping out of pits. I mean, normally we can run up walls and super jump, so replacing that with a double jump is quite the restriction. In earlier builds, Mort worked way differently, following Pepino like a toppin. Instead of replacing moves, he gave Pepino the double jump and Mort hook on top of his regular moveset. Pepino could even throw Mort forwards. While it was kind of unintuitive to control, I prefer this old version of Mort over the current version. Overall, Fun Farm is a fine level, not one I particularly come back to often, but I have a good time with it whenever I do. Fortunately, our next level is by far my favorite in Floor 2. Welcome to Fast Food Saloon, a place where all the rootin' tootin' cowboys come to relax, have a few beers, and bet on horse races. This level encourages quick movement, as emphasized by the level's main gimmick, races against Horsey. Horsey is a living wooden horse. He'll race you in certain rooms. Reach the flag before he does, and you'll earn a toppin. If he beats you, though, that toppin is locked for the rest of the level. This level also features fans that gradually drift Pepino upwards, and are mostly used as hazards to trip you up during races. And to end off the gimmicks, there's yet another transformation with the weenie mount. That's right, every level in Floor 2 has a unique transformation. The weenie mount is simple, allowing Pepino to move at high speeds until hitting a wall. Jumping will dismount the weenie, and will typically put Pepino at Mach 4 if the weenie was running really fast. Fast Food Saloon is a very fun level, I enjoy playing it quite a bit. 
The escape sequence has one room that is pretty annoying at times. There's a lot of fans and ranch shooters, so if you're not careful and get hit, you can get carried pretty far by the fans. Other than that, it's one of my favorite levels in the game. And the music is fantastic as always. Fast Food Saloon song, Yeehaw Delivery Boy, was one of the first Pizza Tower songs I learned to play on guitar, and then I figured out how to play it on banjo, where it sounds 10 times better. Enough with the anecdotes, let's move on. Now that we're done with all the levels on floor 2, it's time for the next boss, and this one is quite the challenge. The Vigilante is a cheese slime who fights for the justice of all cheese slimes in the tower, and Pepino is caught in his sights. The Vigilante's fight is unique in that Pepino foregoes his grab for a powerful new transformation, the Revolver. The Revolver fires bullets that deal a tiny bit of damage to the Vigilante, who needs 8 total hits to lose 1 HP. Fortunately, the Revolver can also be charged up, which will fire a giant bullet that deals 6 hits instead of 1. The Vigilante can be either the hardest fight in the game if you're going in blind, or the easiest if you know what you're doing. The Vigilante's attacks feature a lot of projectiles that can fill the screen very fast. There will be bullets flying, dynamite exploding, cows bouncing, and it all leads to a chaotic fight. However, if you charge your revolver with the right timing, you can hurt the Vigilante before he gets the chance to attack, and if you're good at it, he'll effectively be stunlocked during the entire fight. Don't underestimate the Vigilante though. One missed bullet and he'll fill the screen before you know it. He's very commonly a roadblock for new players, and he'll give players going for a P-rank a hard time. Though I don't know why I managed to P-rank his fight on my first try for this video. He's a tough fight, but I guess I just got lucky. And the fight ends with a one-on-one -on -one duel that is pretty easy to win. And that is all of Floor 2. Overall, it's a very good world with some great levels and a tough boss. Now, let's move on to Floor 3, the Vacation Resort. Welcome to Floor 3, featuring a very loose vacation and travel theme. On this odd floor, we'll be exploring a lively beach, a forest full of gnomes, the depths of outer space, and a golf-themed restaurant. Let's begin with my favorite level on this floor. Crest Cove takes place on a beautiful pink sanded beach filled with walking pineapples, cheese slimes that spit spikes at you, and waters filled with dangerous piranhas. This level features groovy music and eye-catching scenery that really makes it memorable. And the gimmicks it introduces are nothing to scoff at either. You'll be seeing a lot of water on the stage, but don't try swimming in it. Still waters will allow you to run over them at high speed, but drop below Mach 3 at all and you'll be bitten by a piranha apple. It's like a piranha pineapple. Interestingly, despite receiving a unique TV HUD graphic, being bitten by a piranha apple doesn't count as a transformation, despite how similar the water is to blood sauce. You'll also find water currents that fling Pepino in the direction the water is flowing, often flinging him down holes, onto other water currents, or directly into Pillar John. The new transformation used in this level is Barrel Pepino, giving our chef the ability to roll up slopes instead of mock run, while also restricting his grab and crouch. This transformation can seem boring and slow at first, especially since Pepino hangs in the air for a second before falling back down a slope, but it can be really fun once you'll learn to can stand back up in mid-air. This makes for some segments where it's faster to just stand up and walk rather than keep rolling, and there are even sub-segments where you have to stop rolling else you fall back down. Crest Cove is another shining example of a level that rewards good movement and stringing moves together, as a lot of rooms are set up for you to build up and maintain high speed. There are a few moments where it is beneficial to take it a little slow, like the third secret where you parry cannonballs from a goblin bot, or a few of the barrel segments, but in general the level encourages you to be fast. Crest Cove is easily one of my favorite levels in the game, only falling behind a couple levels later on. This is going to be an odd level to talk about. You see, while Gnome Forest has a pretty simple theme and good music, it doesn't introduce that many new mechanics or gimmicks. And the one it does introduce is pretty easy to explain, the big mushrooms just bounce you up. However, there is one mechanic introduced in Gnome Forest that makes this level a little harder to talk about. This is Gustavo and Brick. They're the funny guys you see running around the different hub floors. They've become friends and now you get to control them as a new playable character. While they still have the fundamental controls of a platformer, they differ wildly from Pepino. They can still mock run, and they can actually build up speed faster than Pepino, but they can only go to Mach 3 and can't climb up walls. 
the grab is completely replaced. Gustavo performs a spin attack if grab is pressed, and he kicks brick like a cannon if up and grab are pressed together. Gustavo and Brick are much floatier than Pepino, as they have a double jump, a wall jump similar to the Mario games, and can even jump on enemies to kill them. They're basically like Pizza Tower's version of Mario and Yoshi. Unfortunately, in general, I just don't like playing them as much as I do Pepino. They are still fun to control, their levels are designed around their abilities after all, but they just don't hit the same highs that Pepino does. Gnome Forest makes good use of their abilities, but to me it's generally bogged down by how slower Gustavo and Brick tend to be. One part of Gnome Forest I do really like though is how you get the toppings. We finally get to see what a regular day at the pizzeria is like, as you have to deliver gnome pizzas to five different gnomes to get each toppin'. If you're too slow, the gnome pizza will grow cold and you'll lose that toppin' until you retry the stage, similar to Horsey and Fast Food Saloon. I've seen far less people complain about the time limit when delivering the pizzas in Gnome Forest, despite them being incredibly similar to Horsey. Overall, Gnome Forest is a decent stage. It's not really one I play often, nor do I tend to look forward to it whenever I'm replaying the game. To me, it's an alright stage sandwiched in between two amazing stages. I don't blame people for liking it, though. Gustavo and Brick's gameplay is a huge breath of fresh air after playing just Pepino for two whole floors. I think it was a good idea to make a stage featuring a new playable character. And we won't see the last of Gustavo and Brick, so say bye to them for now as we move on to our next level. Welcome to the far reaches of outer space. Deep Dish 9 takes place across a variety of environments in space, from a giant spaceship to a green, goopy planet and even a planet made of cheese. This level features a couple new gimmicks, two of which are thrown at you in just the first room. The rocket transformation forces Pepino to take a ride on a fast-moving rocket, which can destroy stupid rats and various asteroids dotted around the stage. He can speed up and turn the rocket around to travel around corners and even fly up and down to cross gaps and ledges. Dismounting the rocket will put you into Mach 4, similarly to the Weenie Mount. The rocket is used quite a bit during Deep Dish 9, enough for you to get comfortable with how it works but not get bored with it. You'll also use the Anti-Gravitational Olive quite a bit, which is a bubble around Pepino that carries him upwards towards the ceiling. This isn't a transformation like the rocket, so it doesn't get a TV HUD screen. It's generally just used to travel up long vertical corridors, considering that's basically the only thing it can do. Deep Dish 9 focuses on fast movement and reactions, much like Crust Cove, but it doesn't have as much of a focus on it as Crust Cove does. Nevertheless, it is still a really fun level thanks to the focus it does have. Deep Dish 9's theme is executed amazingly. The environments look great, and fortunately there are no jarring cuts to the different planets. In earlier builds, you would go through a door in the spaceship and end up on the green planet, but in the final game there are rockets that display a cutscene of Pepino crash landing on the next planet, which perfectly connects the unique environments together in a very clever way. Deep Dish 9 is a great level, and I love returning to it time and time again. It's just very well made and I think it's on par with a lot of the game's greatest levels. Next up, let's get to a level that is very hit or miss for a lot of people. Me personally, I'm somewhere in the middle. Golf, unsurprisingly, is about golf. The main gimmick of the level is this guy, Greaseball. He owns the restaurant the level takes place in, and today we'll be giving him blunt force trauma to the head. He's our ball in this sadistic game of golf. All we gotta do is hit him into the hoops at the end of each course. You have to do these courses to beat the stage, as these blocks don't open until you get Greaseball in the goal. This is why golf is such a love-it-or-hate-it stage. A lot of people really like the unique mechanics of golf and find it fun to ram into Greaseball at high speeds to send him flying. Others hate the golfing system in this level and think it kills the game's pace. I actually agree with both sides. Golf can be very fun at times, especially in long hallways where all you need to do is ram into Greaseball and send him flying. On the other hand, the courses that require more thinking are much slower than I'd like, and taking it slow is not something I want to be doing in a game like Pizza Tower. That's why I'm kind of split on this level. I don't particularly love it, nor do I really hate it. I just think it's pretty good most of the time. The level makes heavy use of the ball transformation, which was first seen in Pizza Escape's third secret, but it's used much more in this stage. In this form, Pepino rolls in a ball until he either hits a wall or takes damage. Something unique to this transformation is that it can kill pin rats, special variants of stupid rats that can only be killed by ball Pepino. It's mostly used to reach Grease Ball in the Berg course, but is heavily used during the escape in order to get rid of pin rats. The ball transformation is used pretty well here. It's a very simple transformation, but there's not really much you can do with a ball, so I can cut it some slack. One of my favorite things about golf is that you can just 
skip most of the golfing. The first three rooms have required golfing and so does the room with Pillar John, but other than that, you can just skip all the extra courses. You don't even have to do half of the escape sequence. There's a speedrunning trick called Berg Skip where you use a burger golfer to hit Greaseball into Pillar John while you run back to the entrance of the room. There's something very liberating about a level where you can skip any segment you don't like with very little repercussions. Overall, I do enjoy golf. I have warmed up to it slowly over my 80 hours of playtime, and I imagine it won't be very long until I love it as much as others do. It's fun to speedrun, and it's a good level for a P-Rank. Since grabbing or hitting grease ball refills and pauses the combo meter, it's a very easy P-Rank for the most part. Now that we're done with the levels, it's time for the boss, and we're going up against our most chaotic foe yet. The third boss is Pepino's rival, The Noise. This pizza-hating maniac has been tormenting Pepino for as long as he can remember. It's finally time for him to meet his maker. The Noise didn't come empty-handed, however, and he's got plenty of tricks up his sleeves to tip the scales in his favor. Unlike the other bosses, The Noise will swap between four attacks randomly on each hit point. He can ride on a skateboard, fly with a jetpack, bounce on a pogo stick, or drop bombs from a balloon. You'll never know which attack is coming next, but he'll always use each move twice per phase. After he uses an attack once, he'll use a slightly upgraded version next time. He'll jump with the skateboard, bounce more with the jetpack, drop bombs with the pogo stick, and drop two bombs with the balloon. And his antics don't stop there, they get even worse in the second phase. In phase 2, the noise starts adding nasty tricks to all of his attacks to trip up Pepino. He'll kick his skateboard to stun Pepino, his jetpack will explode to get a cheeky hit in, he'll slam the ground with his pizza crusher after using the pogo stick, and he'll drop a decoy after using the balloon. All of the Noise's attacks create a very chaotic fight where you never know what the Noise will throw at you next, but there's one move that can tilt the scales back in your favor. The parry is your best friend in this fight. Every attack of his is easily dodged by a few parries, and if you can do it right, you'll never get hit once. It gives the fight a sort of rhythm that the other bosses don't really have. The Noise is my second favorite boss fight for this reason. The intense music, the chaos of the Noise's attacks, and the amount of I hear during the fight, it all comes together to make an extremely fun boss fight. The Noise isn't one to play it fair, and after hitting him for the last time, he finally shows his trump card. Before he can gun Pepino down, however... Oops, guess he must have not expected her to show up. Well, that was Floor 3. A pretty good floor, all things considered. Two great levels, and two pretty decent levels with a very fun boss. Let's see if Floor 4, known as the Slum, can keep this pace up. Here in the Slum, all of the levels follow an industrial or city theme. We'll be exploring a city in its Chinatown, a factory making Pepino robots, a dirty sewer, and a giant freezer. Let's begin with our first level, which happens to be to our immediate left. The Pig City takes place in, well, a big city. It's filled with pig residents, tired pizzas just trying to get to work, and police officers on the lookout for criminals. Unfortunately, they seem to have mistaken Pepino for whoever they're hunting. Similarly to Oregano Desert, all of the toppins are in special challenge areas behind taxis, which will bring you to the start of their respective challenge area. These areas act like mini-secrets, teaching you how to use this level's gimmicks. You'll find rat balloons that float Pepino upwards, grind rails that force Pepino to grind in one direction, and ramps that fling you in an arc if you run on it in Mach 2. A lot of rooms in this level's first half are designed to let you easily flow through it. There's usually some sort of circular path that leads you to a special reward before looping you back to where you came from. The first taxi room illustrates this well, and so does the small grind rail segment in the room with the second taxi. It helps the level feel very natural and fluid to play, like you're not being forced down specific paths and are just going the way the level takes you. That's not where the level ends, however, because at the end of the third taxi room, you'll get caught by the cops and sent to jail. Fortunately, Gustavo and Brick are here to bail you out. The second half of this level is played as Gustavo and Brick, and to me, their half of the Pig City is way better than Gnome Forest. A big part of why I enjoy this segment so much more than Gnome Forest is that Gustavo and Brick interact with the level's gimmicks differently. Rather than drifting upwards with a balloon, Brick will eat the balloon, then rocket upwards by releasing the balloon's air. Instead of grinding on rails, Gustavo will hang under them, allowing him to cross large gaps without Brick's help. It's a very unique idea that makes the Pig City one of the best levels in the game. 
It swaps what the gimmicks do right before they start getting stale, keeping the entire level fresh throughout. The run back during pizza time is quite short, however. All of the taxis disappear during the escape, so it's just a straight run back to the jail cell Pepino is locked in. After breaking Pepino free, then you're just a few rooms away from the door. All in all, the Pig City is a very good level, and a great way to start off Floor 4. I really enjoy controlling Gustavo and Brick here. The unique ways they interact with the level's gimmicks make their segment very fun to run through. I'm glad there was one level where both playable characters got equal time in the spotlight. Let's hope this good streak continues with the next level. Sorry, I uh, think I jinxed it. Pepperbot Factory isn't a bad level, but it definitely doesn't hit the same highs that the Pig City just did. Pepperbot Factory takes place in, well, a factory, which produces robotic copies of Pepino. You'll find these Pepperbots scattered throughout the level, and they'll do different attacks based on Pepino's moves. The main gimmicks in this level are conveyor belts, machines that spawn either dash pads or outlets, and the box transformation. A box stamper will squish Pepino down into a pizza box, completely changing how he controls. In this form, Pepino can't mock run, but he'll gradually build up speed while walking and is generally a bit slippier. His grab is replaced by a spin that can kill enemies and stupid rats, which is really good for staying in the air. He can also jump 10 times in the air, each jump giving less and less height until Pepino can't jump anymore. Box Pepino is honestly quite fun to control. It's a unique moveset that makes for some interesting platforming segments. It also gave us Peppybot Factory's third secret, which is really fun to pull off perfectly. Peppybot Factory as a whole is okay, every individual mechanic and gimmick is a good idea, it's just that they're not used the best in the level. At best, there could be some pretty cool obstacles to avoid, at worst, the obstacles can either be skipped over or are incredibly annoying to get through. Everybody who has tried P-ranking this level has lost a run to the last conveyor belt that spits out dash pads. I think in general it falls short of being a truly good level and ends up just being okay. If the ideas the level had were executed a bit better, I think it would be a really fun and enjoyable level. Well, let's hope our next level is a step up from that. I fucking jinxed it again. If you were to ask me what I think is Pizza Tower's worst level, I'd have to say oh shit. Some people will argue Peppybot Factory or a certain upcoming level, but I actually quite enjoy those levels. I don't really enjoy Oh Shit, despite how much I've played it. I don't think this game has a single bad level, but Oh Shit comes incredibly close. Oh Shit takes place in a gross, stinky sewer filled with literal piles of shit, and the level's name is very fitting, as you'll likely be saying Oh Shit every time you get close to losing your combo. The level has a few gimmicks to call its own. The sewer pipes are just the teleporter pizzas from Deep Dish 9 with an absurdly long animation, and they launch you out at Mach 3 if the exit pipe is horizontal. If it's pointed upwards or downwards, it'll launch you in that direction until you hit the ceiling or the ground. You'll find these giant cheese slimes that spit out huge cheese balls. If you touch the cheese ball, you'll get stuck in it with the cheese ball transformation. You can't do anything while in the cheese ball, you're just rolling along until you hit a wall. And when you do, you're stuck in the sticky cheese transformation. Sticky Cheese Pepino is incredibly slow, can stick to walls, can't jump very high, and is generally annoying to use. It seemed cooler in the earlier builds where you could stick to ceilings and slide around on them, but Tour de Pizza nerfed it, and now it's the worst transformation in the game. Fortunately, there is one good gimmick in Oh Shit. The trash pans will launch you upwards when you land on them, and you'll be able to slide along the ground with their lid. It's basically like the corpse from Waste Yard with the added ability to skip across the surface of water, including water currents that would normally send you flying. The lids also build up speed on slopes, so a lot of the trash pan segments feature slopes. Overall, Oh Shit is just kind of there. There's nothing all too enjoyable about it besides from one gimmick. The theming is executed well, but looks gross, and certain rooms are just super annoying. The room with Pillar John is a very annoying segment where you can easily lose your combo by killing the cheese slime too quickly, and don't even get me started on the Mr. Pinch room. Really, the only things preventing me from considering Oh Shit to be outright bad is that Pepino's movement carries the level hard, and the music is incredibly good. Well, this time I really hope we get another good level. Third time's a charm and all that. Hey, look, I was right. Third time is the charm. Refrigerator Refrigerator Freezerator is this game's ice level and has an absurd long name that I'm going to short. Despite being an ice level, RRF actually has no ice physics and instead just has an ice theme and some really fun gimmicks. In this giant freezer, you'll find jetpacks strewn about that will launch Pepino upwards on contact. 
In this state, Pepino can kill enemies on contact, destroy special ice blocks, and will actually bounce off of everything he destroys. He can stay in the air for a long time like this, especially if you chain multiple jetpacks together like the second secret does. You'll also see giant chunks of ice that typically act as platforms and terrain, but if there's a thermostat in the room, you can melt all that ice and clear a new path forwards. There's even a secret that is only accessible by melting the ice. Something about how all the gimmicks chain into one another and affect the environment really elevates this level from good to great for me. The level's theming is spot on, the second and third backgrounds are excellent and very well detailed, and the songs used in the level are some of my favorites on the soundtrack. Don't Preheat Your Oven is so chill and calm, but still has enough energy to keep it in line with the rest of the OST. Towards the second half of the level, you'll start getting hounded by a fake Santa on a jetpack, who will toss Snowman down at you to trip you up. Fortunately, he's easily dispatched with a thrown enemy or a super taunt. Then, nearing the end of the level, you'll fall down a long hole into a room containing a peculiar slice of pizza. This is the Pepper Pizza transformation. It's quite special among transformations as it doesn't remove any of Pepino's abilities, instead just adding on to and improving upon many of his moves. Pepino now can spin in the air to fly, he can kill any enemy on contact, and he can melt small ice blocks by spinning into them. He's even got a rocking tune to go along with his transformation, but we don't get to hear it for long before we're interrupted by pizza time. Trust me though, On the Rocks is a banging tune that is unfortunately missing a proper ending. I've heard some people say they don't like the Pepper Pizza transformation, but I honestly really like it. It's a huge power chip, and makes the ending to RRF really fun. It can be a bit unwieldy at times, but mastering the flying spin can make the escape go by insanely quickly. In general, I just love RRF. It's very close to being my favorite level. There's just one level that beats it out, just barely though. The execution of all of its gimmicks or gives the level a majority of my praise, and the theming and music are just the cherries on top. There aren't even any ice physics. It's a really good ice level. So there goes the levels in Floor 4. A very mixed bag, two great levels with two okay levels. Let's see how our boss stacks up. Uh-oh. This creepy fellow is fake Pepino, a messed up, gooey clone of Pepino. Everything about him is off-putting. He's very similar to Pepino in looks, his restaurant is full of trash, all of his moves are twisted copies of Pepino's ability, everything about him is designed to throw you off. Even the way you hurt him is different from every other boss. You have to hit him two times before he becomes vulnerable to damage, but even then it never feels like you're actually hurting him. It's like you're teaching this fake how to fight you, how to copy you. How to be you. If that's not enough, after taking damage, a bunch of fake Pepino clones will pop out of the ground and try to overwhelm you with the attack you just dealt with. Certain attacks like the Mach Run or Super Jump can be very overwhelming if you aren't expecting their variations on the attack. After hitting fake Pepino six times, he sinks back into the ground to rest up for phase two, and when he comes back, he doesn't pull any more punches. He will try to grab you immediately. And now his clones will run around the arena doing different attacks too, just to make things even more chaotic. This is where the fight turns from a manageable, if creepy battle, to a chaotic mess of clones and projectiles. Clones will be falling from the ceiling, trying to jump you, they'll even throw their heads at you. If you're not careful, you can get swarmed and lose a lot of health. Fortunately, the clones of Fake Pepino have darker clothes than the real one does, so you can still spot them in all the chaos. Thanks to every little detail about this fight, the background, the music, the attacks, the entire battle feels like it'll never end. It feels like you're fighting a futile battle, one where you can't win, all you can do is give up. But if you keep pushing, you'll eventually knock Fake Pepino's health down. And when you deal that final blow, you might think the fight is finally over. But it's not. Suddenly you're being chased by a giant monstrous version of Fake Pepino through a dark, twisting hallway. The only choice is to run, and run as fast as your Italian legs can carry you. Falling behind will let Fake Pepino catch up to you, and he'll deal 2 damage every time he touches you. Fortunately for you, this escape was nerfed in a few updates, leading to it being very easy to escape Fake Pepino. Either way, once you've escaped, you've won the fight, and can claim your key. But from now on, you'll have the feeling in the back of your head that you didn't actually kill him. That fake is still in that pizzeria. Just waiting. And that concludes Floor 4. Still a mixed bag, but the boss fight against Fake Pepino really brings it all together. Now it's time to reach the top of the tower, and see what's hiding in the tower's staff-only floor.
Welcome to the last floor. Only three levels stand between us and Pizza Face. Unfortunately for us, they just so happen to be the hardest levels and the scariest, as this entire floor is heavily inspired by horror elements. You'll be facing a haunted castle, an abandoned pizzeria, and an active war zone. Buckle up everyone, prepare for the worst. Welcome to Pizza Scare, a harder and much scarier version of Pizzascape. This haunted castle is filled to the brim with wizards, ghosts, bats, and all that nasty spooky stuff. Fortunately for us, the gimmicks used in Pizza Scare aim to help us tackle these horrors. First are the priests, who have turned themselves into exorcists. Touch one and they'll bless you with a holy cross, powerful enough to kill any ghosts in your path and protect you from all damage. You'll find them scattered throughout the stage, usually before a long line of ghosts. You'll also see ramps from the pig city strewn about, though they're put in a few annoying spots, especially during the escape sequence. The main gimmick present throughout the level is a big reason why many don't like this level. Upon entering the castle proper, you'll start being haunted by the Ghost King, who you cannot hurt, but he cannot hurt you. However, he can possess nearby traps to try and hurt you. He'll drop anchors on you, zap you with a giant outlet, and kick you with a deactivated goblin bot. Sometimes he'll get stuck in a TV, requiring you to destroy it to continue forwards. The Ghost King and his traps are what most of the level focuses on. You'll often be forced to take a side path to reach the TV the King is trapped in, with plenty of enemies along the way to keep your combo up, or potentially end it. It's also pretty common to be given a stretch of ground filled with different traps, requiring quick reaction time to avoid at high speeds. Usually these boil down to jump when you see an outlet, don't when you see an anchor. In a unique twist, towards the end of the level, you'll have to intentionally trap the Ghost King in a TV so you can go kill Pillar John, then you have to run back to grab the Ghost King to progress. All in all, I quite like the gimmicks in Pizza Scare. I think they all come together for a very challenging yet enjoyable level. I never usually have a hard time keeping my combo up, save for the last room in the escape, where messing up and losing your combo is all too common. Pizza Scare also has some amazing visuals and music. The backgrounds are some of the best in the game, very creepy and atmospheric, especially the first and third. The decorations like giant pumpkins and living flames you find throughout the level add an extra layer of spookiness to it all that makes me love it even more. I totally understand why some people don't like this level or call it the worst level in the game, but I just find it really fun. Pizza Scare has just the right amount of difficulty for it to be challenging without being unfair. My only complaint is that the level's song, which is called There's a Bone in My Spaghetti, should be called Creepypasta or something similar. The joke was right there. Welcome to the old creepy pizzeria where monsters lurk in the dark. Here in Don't Make a Sound, we're required to sneak past the alarms undetected and make it up to the pizzeria's attic, where Pillar John is hiding. It won't be easy getting there though, as this place has some tight security. Strewn throughout the stage will be patrollers, both grounded ones that walk around and flying ones that sit in place. Both types have a cone of light that indicates where they can see Pepino, and if they spot him, you'll only have 5 seconds to kill them before they raise the alarm. And if they raise the alarm, then you better start running, because the room's top and monsters will wake up. The top and monsters are the main threat this level bases itself around. If a patroller raises the alarm, whatever top and monsters are in the room will wake up and begin chasing Pepino as best they can. There are five top and monsters total, each with their own unique traits. The mushroom and sausage are the basic ones. They'll run towards Pepino and destroy any outlets in their way. Neither of them can fit through small gaps, giving Pepino some form of safety. While the mushroom runs at a set speed, the sausage will gradually build up speed until he's running faster than any of the other top and monsters. The cheese will chase Pepino similarly to the mushroom, but can jump onto the ceiling and continue the chase in certain rooms. Contrary to popular belief, it can't phase through any bit of terrain. Rather, the top and monsters have a special type of ground collision to decide where they can and cannot go. Parts of the terrain that Pepino can walk on do not have monster collision, allowing the cheese monster to phase through them. The only chasing monster to not care about collision is the tomato, who slowly flies towards Pepino thanks to its strings, able to pass through walls to continue the pursuit. All of these top and monsters physically chase Pepino through rooms, but the last monster, the pineapple, takes a more passive role. He only appears during pizza time, where he'll spawn piranha apples to chase Pepino, and he'll wake up any other top and monsters in the room to give chase. The entire level is based around trying to sneak through each room, destroying any patrollers that might sound the alarm. Don't make a sound is the most nerve-wracking level in the game, as one wrong move could guarantee a sudden jump scare by one of the monsters. If they do catch you, you'll get jump scared and sent back to the beginning of the room in the animatronic transformation. 
It's one of the only transformations that hinders you. After a few seconds though, it goes away. In the second to last room, you'll be chased by all four top one monsters on your way into the attic, but if you can get up there safely, you are rewarded with a way to fight back. You'll find the gun box from the vigilante fight, but it won't give you the revolver. This is the shotgun transformation, easily one of the best transformations in the game. Rather than using his bare hands to kill enemies, Pepino can now fire a powerful shot from his shotgun and kill any enemy in his path, including the top and monsters. In one fell swoop, this level goes from a terrifying trek through a monster-filled pizzeria into the most cathartic payback session of all time. The rest of the escape sequence involves running through new and old rooms, tearing apart any enemies and obstacles still standing as you make your way back to the door. Don't make it sound as an insanely well-made level. The atmosphere fits the gimmick and locale perfectly, and it leads to some of the most stressful moments I've had while playing this game. And the escape sequence is executed so perfectly, because by giving you a way to fight back, the game has turned a seemingly impossible scenario for Pepino into one of the most memorable parts of the game. And also, before I move on, I know I'm going to get a ton of comments if I don't mention this, the level is loosely based on Five Nights at Freddy's. It's obvious enough that I don't feel like I have to point it out, but knowing what the YouTube comment section is like, I'd rather not take any chances. Anyway, let's move on to our last level, and this one's a real treat. It's awfully quiet here. There's no music, no sound effects apart from my own footsteps. The way forward is blocked by target blocks, and luckily there's a shotgun here. Let's just pick this up and... Welcome to war, where the only thing keeping us from dying is whatever time we have left before the level explodes. In a game where the main gimmick is running back to the beginning of a level under a time limit, it only makes sense that there'd be a level where the timer is active from the start, but it's executed here in a unique way. Upon picking up the shotgun, we're given 40 seconds to start running. Throughout the level, we'll find war terminals which add 30 seconds to the timer when destroyed. In order to not die while still getting everything, we have to balance exploration with running, as taking too long will waste precious time. And don't think you're safe in the secrets. The secrets are intentionally placed out in the open so you'll be drawn to them for a short break, but unfortunately for you, the timer doesn't stop in the secrets. Better manage your time well. Throughout this entire level, you're equipped with a shotgun transformation, so while you've got the power to destroy everything in your path, your ability to gain speed quickly is unfortunately lost. You'll be facing enemies like pizza soldiers that shoot bullets at you, or cardboard tanks that fire homing missiles at you. The shotgun can't kill stupid rats, so you'll often have to kite missiles towards the rats to clear a path. If being out in an open battlefield is too intense for you, then have no fear, as soon you'll enter the underground lab, where the last half of the level takes place. Down here you'll face a new enemy, Pepino clones. They look identical to Pepino, but they show their true colors by melting and reforming just like fake Pepino. Actually, this segment of the level answers a couple questions you may have. How is fake Pepino made, and how does Pillar John show up in every stage? In the background of the underground lab, you can see giant test tubes with clones of Pepino and Pillar John, so it's likely that Pizza Face has been cloning Pepino with the intent to replace him, and he's been cloning Pillar John to hold up every stage in the tower. War is my favorite level in the game. Its intense music, pulse-pounding gameplay, and perfectly executed theme all come together to make a truly stressful experience. But it's an experience I want to return to time and time again. You can feel the anxiety coming from Pepino here, because, fun fact, Pepino is actually a war veteran. Some will say that the main developer denied this, but I've heard that he was drunk when he said that, and confirmed Pepino was a war veteran, so that's what I choose to believe. Either way, in my opinion, War is Pizza Tower's best level. A couple levels come close, but none reach the same heights that War does. Nothing compares to War's second lap, where you lose your shotgun and are given three extra minutes to run back through the entire level. Only do this if you're confident in your abilities. Well, after escaping the battlefield, we've finished all of the levels in Floor 5. The only thing left to do is beat Pizza Face and save our restaurant. We catch him mid-shower, so he's at least not prepared for us. Take a deep breath, and let's do this. Our final battle is an epic showdown on top of the tower. This first phase is relatively simple. Pizza Face will spawn an enemy from his nose, grab it and throw it back at him. If you hit him with the enemy, you can then attack him head on. 
The less health he has, the more enemies he'll spawn, and the enemies themselves will be more dangerous. If you're going for a P rank, this will likely be the phase that you get stuck on the most. It can be hard to avoid all of the enemy's pizza face spawns when he's at low health. If you're getting overwhelmed, your best bet is to grab an enemy and throw it straight ahead, clearing out every enemy on the ground in one fell swoop. Once you manage to deplete his health, pizza face is done for. Unfortunately, the real mastermind shows himself. This fight's second phase is against Pizza Head, the insane man who is the real cause behind everything Pepino has gone through. He throws Pepino a revolver, and the fight begins. In this phase, Pizza Head will run between both sides of the arena, reaching down and pulling something from the tower to attack Pepino with. He'll toss sticks of dynamite, use the vigilante's Uzi, throw a stupid rat like a baseball, and rip out a chunk of Pizza Escape, flinging fork knights into the air. He'll even pull the TV from the corner of the hut, using it to attack Pepino. The second phase is very chaotic, as almost all of his attacks are projectiles. After dealing 3 damage to him, the destroyed pizza face will fly back in and start spitting cogs onto the arena, adding to the chaos. All the while, Pizza Head is gradually getting faster with less health he has. My main tips are to stay in the middle and stay on the ground for as long as possible. Only jump over the cog if absolutely no other projectiles are on the field. Otherwise, parry it while facing the direction it is rolling. After finally finishing this phase, it seems like it's all over. But it's not. Pizza Head stands back up unscathed and begins pulling up every previous boss. Pizza Head isn't willing to play fair. He wants Pepino dead. Unfortunately for him, Pepino is done with this bullshit. <laughs> In this final phase, Pepino has finally lost it. After everything he's gone through, everything he's had to endure, he's finally been tipped over the edge. This third and final phase is a boss rush, testing you on what you remember from every previous boss. If you remember their patterns and attacks, you'll be gold. Fortunately, thanks to Pepino's Italian rage, he pummels each boss into oblivion when he gets the chance, taking away half of their health bar each time he attacks. When Vigilante shows up, you can't hurt him because you don't have the revolver. Fortunately for us, Gustavo shows up to lend a hand, and by that I mean we'll be throwing him directly at the vigilante to stun him. Gustavo also appears while fighting the noise and fake Pepino, allowing us to chain two attacks in a row to slice through the health. Finally, after cutting through the past bosses, Pizza Head appears again for one final fight. Pizza Head's attacks are easy to avoid, just stay away from him and charge in when the time is right. Unlike the other bosses, he's got three full health bars, so you need six hits to take him down. The entire boss fight as a whole is an amazing climactic finale to a fantastic game. The first phase really shows the weight of the situation, the second phase flips everything on its head with chaotic attacks and music, and the third phase is the triumphant payback this entire game has been building up to. It's one hell of a way to finish the game. As for the P rank, it's a test of endurance. All I can do is wish you good luck. You'll need it. Don't ever give up. And when you land that finishing blow, Pepino lets out all of his anger, pummeling Pizza Head so hard that they gradually rise into the sky before Pepino delivers one last pile driver directly onto the tower. Our journey doesn't actually end here, however. We need to get out of this place. Jumping down the hole and crossing the hallway, we enter our true final level. The only thing in this room is the original Pillar John. Look at how worn down he is. I feel bad for wanting to knock him down. Welcome to the crumbling tower of pizza, a climactic escape from the tower. The stage will have us running through all of the tower's floors, and since the elevators are out of commission, we'll be taking plenty of side paths to get from floor to floor. Remember the John blocks scattered around the floors? Those were just a small tease of this escape sequence. This level throws almost every gimmick and mechanic from each level to test your abilities and what you've learned. Next to floor 5, you'll be using the shotgun, dealing with bats, tanks, and the pineapple topping monster. In the next couple rooms, you'll be using the ramps, the trash pan, and the rat balloon used in floor 4. It's all strung together to make a level with so many gimmicks feel very cohesive and fluid. Nothing feels out of place. You'll also find enemies from each floor of the tower near their respective floor. You'll find bad rats on floor 2, pizza soldiers on floor 5, ninja slices on floor 4, and so on. This level combines so many things from every floor without it feeling jumbled or confusing. In your head, you might consider this level a final escape sequence of sorts, a panicked rush back to the beginning. But that can't be further from the truth. 
This level instills you with a feeling of power, like you're on top of the world and you're never coming down. The music is this energetic take on a pizza time that fills you with the power to take on anything the game throws at you. The crumbling tower of pizza is not a frantic escape, it's a victory lap. A victory lap that makes you look back on everything you've dealt with, and when you reflect on your journey, you'll find there's only one thing you have left to say. Bye bye! And that was Pizza Tower. It's hard to come up with some sort of conclusion to this video. I mean, what else is there for me to say? Not only have I praised this game up and down throughout this entire video, but what I could say has been said by so many other people. It's an amazing game, truly one of the best I've ever played. If you haven't played Pizza Tower yet, I highly encourage, no, I implore you to go buy it and play it. It's worth the price tag. It's far more worth than the price tag. I've gotten so much enjoyment out of this game. My total playtime right now sits at 80 hours, and I beat the game in only 4. If that, along with the rest of this video, isn't enough to convince you to play it, then you just may genuinely not be into this kind of game. That's okay. As long as people know about Pizza Tower and understand why so many people like me are obsessed with it, then I've done my job, and I'll be happy. I have so much more I could say about this game, but I'll save those thoughts for another time. If you've enjoyed this video, I ask that you consider subscribing, leaving a like or a comment, all that usual YouTube crap. It does help a lot, and it tells me that people want to see more of this. Thanks for watching, and thank you Tour de Pizza for making an amazing game. I wouldn't be where I am without it. I've been Spectern, this has been my review of Pizza Tower, and I'll see you all next time.